One, welcome to New Mexico Black Rifle Operators Union. I'm your host, Sean. So I was thinking about what I was going to podcast today, and I thought I could give more updates, but I'm not going to, about what's going on in the 2A community. What I actually wanted to talk about is about our community in general. One of the greatest gifts you can give, especially to someone who is an appreciation, uh, someone who appreciates the 2A, is a chance to share some of your collection. So I have a really close friend he, he's been my boss before. He's now my brother in all way, Boot Blood. Um, I have several of these guys. Um, well, I don't want to say several. I have a small circle of these friends. One of them is the one that has gifted me the mic that is uh, you hear me speak on uh, when it's the loudest and clearest um, and has been a constant supporter of me in the 2A. Uh, but this guy isn't the one I'm talking about. Um, my friend in and former mentor, and now my one of my best friends, for his birthday, which has recently passed, I told him that given a day, pick the day, that we can get together. Now, he's an aficionado of, of firearms, specifically World War II firearms. And he has a brother who has a lot of firearms like I do. And I decided that for a gift, I would give him the opportunity to shoot some of the guns that we went to Battlefield Las Vegas and he didn't get to shoot. So uh, um, it's kind of funny. I have quite a a collection of, uh, I guess you'd call them antiquated firearms from back in the gap from World War II and beyond. And he had selected a a series of firearms. Now, to me, this isn't a big deal. Um, You know, ammunition isn't cheap, but... I have plenty of ammunition in these calibers for this reason. You know, this isn't the first time I've had someone come and ask if they could shoot something that was a museum piece, basically, that I have in my collection. So I'm going to take my M1 Garand, uh, my newly acquired 1903 Springfield, my Luger, my K98 uh, Mauser, and uh, my MP5, I believe, is what I said uh, he wanted. He was interested in shooting, so that's not World War II. Um, what else was there? There's one other. Oh, my K98. That's an Israeli K98, my 308. Um, that my it's an inheritance piece from my dad, just like my M1 Garand. On a selected day that he chooses. So since his birthday, he's been very. Uh, indisposed, meaning that he's had a lot of people asking for his attention, he's had his kids, so whenever he chooses to do this, I decided that we'll go do this. Now, why is this important in our community? It's important to share the goodwill and to bring people in that don't normally get to shoot the stuff that you take for granted. You know, the last time I took my K98 out was for my son. My son wanted to shoot it Um, it's something that I've had for a very, very long time. Um, it was one of my first rifles, the first ones I bought because I had to replace one that I had gotten when I was younger. Um, I still have my original K98, uh, 8mm Mauser, but it's an 8mm out 6 now, so it's not as cool. It's sporterized and not, doesn't have the World War II swagger that I think my friend was looking for. You know, he's he's started a, uh, his own entrepreneurial business. Um, in addition to he works in the same field that I do. Um, he's been exceptional in every way in teaching me the craft that I'm in. So much so that, you know, I, I get confident in what I can do. I've had a little bit of ups and downs lately in my current position where, I, you know, as a, as a where I work now, I'm not so much a technical person. I'm more of a supply sergeant for um, an IT industry giant. And that's cool. I wish it paid more. Um, I'm just very thankful for having a job in this current environment. And this mentor of mine, who's always speaking to my skill, there's nothing I could give better to, in my humble opinion, is to to let him take some of my firearms out and, and see what they do, you know. These are pieces that I have collected over the years. Um, my, um, my 
Luger, which is one that has been nickel-plated, so it's not a collectible Luger anymore. Some idiot brought it back from World War II as a bring-back, and one of the things they do is they, to try to jazz it up and make it look and sound better than what it was, they nickel-plated some of them. Um, or this was a service that some people had in World War II, after World War II, for bringbacks to make them seem like they were better than what they were. You know, I had a friend once tell me that his his Luger that was nickel plated was a Luftwaffe Luger, and it was from some Luftwaffe colonel or something. And I had to tell him, I was like, "No, man. In fact, it's worth less than what a normal Luger would be in its original condition." You know, that's the weird part about being in the 2A is knowing what your guns are worth. And these guns I'm taking out to shoot, um, none of my guns in my collection are ones that I, I don't shoot anymore. Um, they're all, that's something that my dad always ingrained in me is that if you have it in your collection, it should be there for a reason. And while my collection has shrunk a little bit because I've, uh, when I was looking for a job, I gave my one of my SIG pistols, well, my only SIG pistol, to my daughter because it was the first pistol she actually loved and she's 22 and it was time for her to have her own pistol for self-defense and that's a big deal for me is making sure my daughter is always being able to take care of herself now back to my buddy though my buddy and I have been through a lot of things you know he's been through a divorce he's been through a career change you know he had the position I had before Um, he mentored me into that position And when it was time for us to leave that position, uh, different times, we all left on our own accord. I miss it. I miss uh, being in K-12s, even though I kind of think it's bad how K-12s are going. To me, I've always been a mission-focused person. And that's one of the reasons why I am such an advocate for the 2A, is I'm very focused on this mission of, of protecting and defending our rights, but also sharing the goodwill of just being able to to show what we have, what we can do, and mentor people. And while this person has mentored me on several levels, maybe it's time I get to mentor him in something that's been in my family, you know, shooting and collecting these particular types of arms and learning their intricacies, um, because that also reflects great on the 2A. You know, if more people did this, maybe we'd have a little bit more compassion from one side of the aisle um, because maybe they'd understand us a little better now this person is obviously firmly in our camp he owns his own collection small collection Uh, most of them are purpose built or purpose for hunting or defending himself whatever it's more so finally being able to give back something maybe a little bit more skill transfer because this gentleman has given me so much in my personal uh, career, you know. I, w- I consider myself a network fighter pilot that gets to load planes now instead of actually getting to fly the planes. But I don't suspect that'll be too much longer, you know. But that camaraderie, that is in the 2A community needs to echo through what we do and the only way I know of building that is being a good steward of it by like doing exactly what I'm doing you know I'll take anyone out to shoot I've taken several leftists out that were anti-gun and turned them pro 2 gun 2A gun you know to to liking guns and it's all because you destigmatize them I'm not going to have to do that when I'm going to show someone how to load an M1 Grand and that's just knowledge transfer that my daddy gave to me you know these are skills that we should hold close to our chest um, all the time and keep them sequestered and siloed off so nobody knows them these are things we should be sharing with everyone my kids know how to do this you know that it would take them a little bit nowadays uh, because they're not as practiced as they once were with like an m1 grand Um, but it is something that reflects more and more as I get closer to the day that my father passed away four years ago soon. Okay, So with that, this is some of those things I get to share with a friend, a close friend, that my dad would have done the same thing. 
And that's what drives me to this passion in the 2A. You know, that that there is no perfection for me in the 2A. There's no free lunch. And what I mean by that is you look at all these cool new widgets and whatevers for whatever rifle platform you like, and there's always a trade-off. You either get more recoil, get a heavier gun, or you don't get the functionality you, you thought you might from a certain platform. The same thing goes with the older stuff. What it does is make you appreciate the modern stuff because you see how far we came from. You know, American rifles went from 9.5 pound rifles, uh, 10 pounds in some cases with optics, if they had optics, um, to now 5.5 pounds is kind of a norm. You know, 6 pounds if you've got it fully loaded with all the optics and most accessories you want. That wasn't a thing back in the day. You know, shooting a long gun like a 1903 Springfield, you learn the, to appreciate what an AR-15 is. Because you instantly realize how much handier an AR-15 is. And why it was put into production and why it was put into service. Because if we stuck to old school technologies, we'd be relegated to being outdated, outclassed on the battlefield. That's one of the things that I've always enjoyed is the history lesson that comes with the 2A. And to share a little bit of le- of that history with a very close friend who's very much interested is awesome. And I think there is no better way to transfer some of that knowledge. And while we're not going to shoot a lot of rounds out of these guns, because I don't have a lot of them for, you know, not hundreds of rounds of aught six or eight millimeter Mauser, but I have enough for them to get the feel general feel of what it was like to shoot it. You know, I'm lucky enough that my Luger takes nine millimeter Luger and uh it'll take standard pressure rounds because they're all Sammy spec. That's what Sammy spec is all about, is keeping the cartridge capable of working in older guns. You know, and that's part of what I mean is that you Think about the history and knowledge and all the skill that it took to and design that it took to manufacture and build these old weapons. And then you look at what they do now. You know, you you look at a an AR fifteen and it's all done by machine, except for the final assembly. If you look at a Luger, it's all hand fitted. And what I mean by that is, yeah, some of the parts were milled and machined, but eventually there was some artisan back in the day that would take a jeweler's file to the finest pieces and rub the burrs off of it and fit them together in a delicately intricate machine that still works to this day. Now, my Luger was made in 1929, I believe. Okay, so it was a war production as they were, as Germany was getting ready to gear up for war. You know, you look at the proof marks and the acceptance marks on some of these guns, uh, Luger specifically, or you look at any of the German guns getting geared up for World War II, you'll see a 1932 stamp on it, and a lot of people make a mistake of knowing that, of, of saying that that's when it was manufactured. No, that's not when it was manufactured. If you look at the history of what happened in World War II, as the as it started to kick off, you know, the Treaty of Versailles forbade Germany from having arms uh, in mass quantities. How they got around that was acceptance marking them by all the same year, even after the date of manufacture. And what they were doing is getting around the Treaty of Versailles until the Treaty of Versailles no longer mattered. little history piece there for you. You look at the M1 Grand. I am fortunate enough to have an M1 Garand that was made in 1937. The war didn't kick off for the United States until 1941. Yet I have a rifle that it looks like the Americans were doing the same thing the Germans were, but maybe not as such a grand scale. They were gearing up for war. And as I reflect on this right now, I wonder if that's what we're doing right now. If you've been paying attention to what's going on around the world, you know, Ukraine, the saber-rattling there, and the 
uh, audio leaks coming out where the Germans have basically basically been caught with their pants down where they helped collude to take out the Kirk Strait Bridge uh, that corrects, that connects Russia to the Crimea using Russian missiles, cruise missiles, or not Russian cruise missiles, German cruise missiles. You know, are we on the precipice of World War III? A lot of people would say we already are. World War III hasn't been officially declared, but we're sure arming one side, and we're sure sticking our thumb on the scale, kind of like we did in World War II. A lot of people don't know, but we were supplying actually kind of both sides. One side we were supplying oil and metal materials. The other side, we started producing arms for them. And we were selling them. You know, there's a reason why you can find a Remington-made Mosin Nagant. There, we have been building weapons for both sides of most conflicts for a long time now. And the main reason we ended up in World War II isn't what you think. It's not the fact that we were just the fact we were attacked by Pearl Harbor. It's the fact that we cut off resources from the Japanese, and the Japanese had no choice but to go to war because they needed the energy resources that we sequestered from them. If you also know the history of World War II and Pearl Harbor specifically, you know that the declaration of war from the Japanese consulate was delayed. That attack wasn't meant to be a surprise attack entirely. The fact is, we actually knew the attack was coming, and we held back so that it could happen, so that would, we could get into the war. You know, it's these history pieces that link me to the 2A forever. These are the lessons I got with my dad, my uncles, my brothers, as I learned about these weapons. You know, there was a, if you look at some of the K-98s towards the end of the war from Germany, you'll find them with canted sights. And this was because they were produced by slave labor by Jews that were imprisoned, that were going to die. And some of them probably did die. Most likely they did. So to help the war effort, help the Allies win, they canted the sights. Or they stuffed cigarette butts in tank treads or in gas tanks and basically sabotaged German technology to help end the war. You know, if you look at what was going on in World War II, you find out more and more how we won that war is we deprived them of resources. You cannot win a war without metal. You cannot win a war without energy, without oil, without gas. And that's how we deprived the German army and brought them to their knees. You know, I look at what we're on the precipice of. And I look at the situations around the world right now. And we are uniquely positioned to actually influence everything that's going on in the world. And apart from nuclear attacks hitting here, be kind of insulated from it. That's been the case since World War II. We've been the biggest dog in the fight. You know, you hear people talk about China, China, China. You know, China is having an economic collapse the likes of which we haven't seen. Uh, if, you, if you pay attention to news that escapes from China, even Xi Jinping is coming out and saying, hey, we got a problem with our economy. We have to quit focusing on gross domestic product um, as an indicator of how great our economy is. To me, that sounds a lot like our president now, in that he's saying that a 17% inflation rate is a great indicator of how good our economy really is. And I guess if you face that against the world, we are doing okay. But what a lot of people think is we get wrapped up in these little echo chambers. And you're not looking at the wider world news. China hasn't been 
a threat to us for a while. Despite what a lot of people think, they have a huge standing army, right, on paper. Then you figure out that they don't have, and they have a bigger navy than ours, if you count whole count. But if you talk about displacement of what actually can sail 1,500 miles to pass the first island chain, the Chinese have a handful of ships that could do it. And they have to pass seven, count them, seven of their worst enemies. And that they're at the end of the kick line to receive oil and gas, even though that they're tied to Russia. Russia physically can't get that stuff to them because they don't have the pipe capacity. What's currently happening right now is the Russians are loading smaller ships in Novorossiysk and offloading them onto larger ships around so that they can sail around the Horn of Africa to get to China because they can't they don't have the pipeline capacity to get it to China them like straight to them. Most of the oil that's produced for China comes from the wrong parts of Russia to get to China. So it goes through Novorossiysk, goes through the war zone. The worst benefactors of this war is China. They've increased their trade with the Russians. You know, this is these are the pieces that I wonder what were people thinking before World War II kicked off? You know, were there economists were the demographic people that were paying attention to the those pieces in Germany, in Central Europe, and watching what was happening and going, yeah, this is going to start a war. I personally am of the volition that the greater world is going to see a huge famine because of what's happening. You know, a lot of people are worried about AI chips, well, about AI taking over. Being a technologist... Being a student of history, I'm not. And that's because most of the high-end AI chips come from one place in Taiwan with over 9,000 processes and 9,000 businesses that are tied to this one single business. And if the rest of the world runs into any kind of problems where they can't ship to that one place, AI goes away because it simply can't be made at the scale we're wanting it to be. You know, it's interesting to think that AI could once or possibly could replace human conscience and humans in general. You know, I know, what does this have to do with gun stuff? I'm getting to that. Is they're all tied together. If you think about the most latest, greatest technological advances in warfare, it isn't a gun, it isn't a missile, it isn't even a nuke. It's what a cyber attack would be. You know, Facebook went down today. That's the type of attack that you need to be more concerned about. Is infrastructure attacks here? And while our people are great at defending against it, even the woke ones in our country, that doesn't mean that people won't overreact. And that maybe sharing some of those skills that with people that aren't the greatest with firearms or sharing some of that knowledge might protect them in the future. Like, share, subscribe, most importantly, be great.